dependence and independence is something that we can care about. Let's take a look at this as an example. Here's the earth from a company, um, let's say, and we've got three samples taken in time. Which one of those three data sets are independent values in time? Discuss with someone around you. And we're going to vote so you have to commit. Equation. 
What have we learned about independence? What's the definition of independence from the previous slide? Beta is zero. If the data are independent, the beta will be zero. Independence is now telling you if two samples are independent, there's no possible relationship between them. Okay? If beta is not zero, there's a relationship between the prior sample and the next sample. That error is just a simple error that gets added to the data. That's our measurement error. But if there's no possible relationship, <coughs> beta is zero. In that first series, theta is positive, in the second series theta is zero, and in the third series theta is negative. What do we mean by negative theta? That gives you that up and down bounce. Okay? One, one value is positive, the next one's above, and the next one's below, and it's above, and it's below. It's sort of oscillating around the mean. Okay? So that's time series analysis, a very basic time series. And we call this negatively autocorrelated, and that series is positively autocorrelated. Data that you will see in practice from any chemical plant, I guarantee you, 90, well, I can't guarantee the number, but most of the time, it will be positively autocorrelated. You will observe this sort of trend. And the reason you observe that sort of trend is because our processes shift and change very slowly. So if you're taking samples rapidly in time, you take a sample now of the temperature in a reactor, and then a minute later you take a sample of the temperature in the reactor, it's still high. And then a minute later the temperature is still high. Right? So you, you're sampling rapidly on a system that's moving slowly, you're going to get that sort of slow moving trends. This sort of trend, what you see this in, in systems that are manually controlled by operators. When an operator controlling a system, for the operator to feel like they're doing something, they're opening the valve, then they've overshot the temperature, then they close the valve again, because now it's too hot, then they open the valve again, then they close it, they open it, they close it. So for the operator to feel like they're doing something useful, they end up doing that sort of thing. And then this sequence in the middle is a totally independent sequence. The key from this discussion is you cannot tell visually what's the way you can tell is by thinking about the process. So for example, in this case, the values of impurity for the last 10 batches, you have to think about the situation before you can tell whether there's independence or not. Okay, so that's an important discussion. Let's move on from there and talk about the next topic, the normal distribution. And if you have that table in front of you that was handed out, um, anyone? Okay, so the normal distribution, very straightforward, you've seen this many times. Let's just take a look at two things that you must remember at the top of your head. The first is, on a normal distribution, we have a mean at the center there we call mu, and we have a standard deviation we call sigma. Okay. Sigma is the point where that curve just starts to have its inflection. And I've shown you the system over there for one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma. The two important things I want you to remember from today's class is that if you take the data at plus one sigma, and minus one sigma, so if it's minus one sigma, that area spanned by plus and minus one sigma, this area of the curve is 70% of the area. This is not something you have to ever look up on the table. Rule of thumb, the area between plus and minus one sigma is 70%. 68.3 The area between plus and minus two sigma is 95%. So take two sigma, 
down two sigma up, that area under that curve is 95%. In other words, it is 5% in the tails to the left. 2.5% in the tail to the left, 2.5% in the tail to the right. Those numbers are important because we're going to see 1 sigma, 2 sigma frequently in this course. And understanding that if you take a data set that's normally distributed, and your numbers between plus and minus 1 sigma, there's a 70% chance, 70% probability that your data come from the region between plus and minus 1. And confirm that on the page in front of you. We'll, I'll show you how to read this table in a minute. Okay, we'll, we can confirm that here as well. So I'll leave that, this slide here as a little exercise for you to fill in on your own time. And let's just emphasize the fact that we've got 70% of our area lying between plus and minus. Now, we <coughs> choose these tables. As a recap for this aspect, we always use them on a normalized basis. We create a new variable which we call the standard variable Z, and that variable is created by centering and scaling. So let's take a look. We've got to take our variable X. This is the measurement you measure on your process. Let's say it's temperature and you measure it in Kelvin. You get your temperature measurement X in Kelvin and you subtract what you need the temperature in Kelvin. Your numerator's units of color. Your denominator is the standard deviation of that measurement. That's going to be in Kelvin as well. So that ratio Z now is dimensions. So the numerator does what we call centering. The denominator does what we call scaling. We've got some centering and scaling over and over in this course. And what this does is this original variable x that temperature variable gets shifted or centered and it gets scaled. And that new variable z now has a mean of which value? What will be the mean of z? Idea. 
maximum values that actually expect on here. What would you expect? As a lower bound than an upper bound. For a well behaved variable. Zero or smaller. 
probability of observing a value zero or smaller is 50%. Is another way of saying that. So take zero up, read it across, I'll get to 0.5. So the interpretation of that is to say the probability of observing a value zero or smaller is a 50% chance of that. Okay, I can do that for different values. Go up, let's say at 80%. Sorry, go up, let's say, let's uh, try so this. Sigma equals 1. Sigma is equal to 1 at that point. So go 1 unit up on the z axis. Up and across, what value should I see over here? Observing a biological 
activity of study You don't need a calculator, you can do this one in your head and you can do it in a few seconds.
we're going to do in this test is we're going to take the theoretical numbers that come from the normal distribution and then we're going to compare them to our actual numbers and if they match up, then we're going to save these data on the normal distribution. So take any values from the normal distribution that you know are normally distributed. And how do we construct those n values? Well, we go to our diagram that looks like this in your notes, this cumulative distribution function, and we take the 10 values along that vertical axis, or n, if you put n. So in this case, we put 10 numbers. So take 10 numbers that span between 0 and 1 cumulative area. So we call this axis here is cumulative area. And bring those 10 numbers over and down, over and down, over and down, etc. You're going to get 10 numbers now on the z axis. They're going to be spaced a little bit funnily. Because you've taken 10 evenly spaced numbers in the vertical axis, bring it across and down, you'll get 10 numbers on that z axis. So now you have 10 z's.
first thing it comes from a distribution with mean of mu. Mu there refers to this system's mean. So x bar then comes from a normal distribution that happens to have the same mean of that system. We don't know what that system's mean is. We know what x bar is, however. And x bar we can say comes from a normal distribution with the same mean. Not a different mean, or shifted shift to the left, or shifted to the right, the same mean. That's really, really strong statement. That if we repeat this process again and again, we're going to get samples that come from that distribution, that mean. The next important point is that it comes from that distribution with variance sigma squared divided by n. That's helpful because the variance sigma squared divide n, let's say n is five times, I take five samples, that that distribution variance has been shrunk five times. Every additional sample you take, that variance shrinks in, in, in. In other words, it says your error goes down. This is very intuitive. You're trying to determine the measurement on the system, let's say the temperature of a reactor, flow rate or the viscosity, you don't just take one sample, you maybe take three samples and then you average them. We've all done this in our lab experiments. Don't just take one number, you take three or four se sequential numbers and you average it. What does an average do? Well, that's exactly what the central limit curve says. Take samples, if you the average, well, that average now, that's an x bar, is as a it comes from a normal distribution of the same mean and greatly reduced variance. It's telling you that you're getting a reliable estimate of that system. And the more samples you take, the more reliable your estimate becomes because your variance shrinks down. And that's very, very intuitive. The more samples you take, the less error you have in your measurement. So we're going to focus on that quite, quite a bit. And our goal with confidence intervals is the following. A lot of times people get confused about confidence intervals and the, the reason for it. Well, the reason is quite simple. If I've got a system and I'm measuring, let's say, the viscosity of that system. Viscosity is a phenomenally difficult measurement to take. For those of you that are not chemical engineers, you may not be aware of that, but some of us might not be aware of that. Viscosity is difficult to measure accurately. So this telling you if I take multiple samples, I'm going to get an accurate measurement. And at measurements, we're going to have, there's going to be some number mu. Mu is a number I don't know. I have no idea what that is. But I'm going to measure mu, and it's going to come from a distribution with mean of mu, and various sigma squared over n, or standard deviation of sigma over root n. So the more samples I take, that distribution will come from n and n. And our goal next class is to find confidence intervals. The confidence interval, all it is, is telling you what this range is. What is this range where in which we expect to find the true process mean? We don't know mu, we never will know mu, but at best what we will do is we'll find bounds, a lower bound and an upper bound. And once we have those bounds, we can say we've got a certain amount of confidence, 95% confidence, or a 70% confidence, or a 99.9% .9 confidence, and that, that bound contains mu. We'll never know what mu is exactly, but we'll have a bound within which we expect to find it. So that's where we're going, and it's really a subtle point to understand, but it's such an important point that we need to be clear of. Okay, so next Monday, we're going to have a day.